Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining, and hopefully everyone had a really great lunch. I know typically after lunch we're a little tired, a little sleepy, but uh, rest assured we're going to be talking about something uh, that everyone enjoys, or at least most people, gaming. So thank you so much for attending here. Um, I think the really awesome part about gaming is, you know, most people think that it may be the next onboarding mechanism for the next 100 million users into Web3, um, albeit there's still a myriad of challenges and an equal number of opportunities. So we have a, you know, highly uh, experienced panel here today to kind of share some of their thoughts. Um, so we'll just kind of jump right into this thing here. So I think the question um, on top of most people's minds is, you know, why do we need NFTs in games? And additionally, do we need other mechanisms like GameFi or DeFi? And then on the flip side of that, what is the value ultimately to players, studios, and publishers? So we'll start on this side with Fan. Um, if you want to answer that question, and we'll just go down the row. Sure, my name is Fan. Uh, I'm the VP of games at Dapper Labs. So I head up the gaming partnership and investment. Super excited to be here. I love to participate more to grow the Web3 community in Seattle and make it a lot bigger because we have so many talents here. And then I don't need to travel every week to other <laughs> conferences. Uh, so to that question, why do we need NFT blockchain uh, in the game? Uh, there are two reasons that I sincerely believe in. So one is digital ownership, right? I think you guys heard about it, no matter in gaming, arts, right, other digital entertainment. When the player can actually own the item uh, and take it, sell it, bring it to other property, games, apps, that's a benefit that I don't think anyone will say, I hate that, right? I think most people will say, how does that work, right? How do you bring it to one game to another game? What's the value? There's a lot of implementation questions that this industry has not solved, but it doesn't really actually deny the benefit that it's cool, that as a user I can earn it, I can do whatever I want. So that's the first reason. The second reason is something that Dapper Lab had experience and success in, and we want to see more awesome gaming entrepreneur to create something similar. So when we created CryptoKitty in 2017, it was an experiment. It was a very, very simple kitty breeding app. That's it, right? You breed the kitty, you have the kitty made with other kitty, and you collect them. And then it blew up, it became so popular that in the community, many, many people went out and built kitty racing app. Uh, hey, buy a hat for the kitty that you own. Hey, kitty Tinder app. And all these apps were built permissionless. They don't have to come to Dapper and then make a phone call to the BD. Hey, can I use your IP in my app? Hey, can we sign a contract? The whole blockchain system make this permissionless and seamless. Now, now that's what we believe in, in the blockchain space, in the gaming space. We believe that this system will give back more of the power and influence to the community. So those are the two reasons. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm Alex West. I'm the president of Many Hands. My company is making a game called Versus, which is a digital TCG. Um, most of my team has a background in Magic the Gathering or other uh, tradable card games. And um, when NFTs started popping up, we were like, oh, we're going to make some other kinds of games. But this is very interesting, because when we look at uh, digital trading card games, they're lacking a lot of the really fun parts of the paper versions of the game. So, uh, paper Magic the Gathering, you can you know, own your cards. If you want, you can pay an artist to you know, doodle something on it, and it changes the value of it. Uh, you can you know, tr trade the card with a friend. Um, and there are collectors involved in the community, people who never play but you know, buy the cards and enjoy uh, owning them. And when you look at the digital version of Magic, uh, you can just buy cards. There's no way to ever cash out. And uh, it punishes all kinds of players. Like, my brother loves to experiment with building decks, and in paper, 
you know, you can buy a card for $20 and like sell it for 18 or trade it for a similar card. And so he gets to keep on experimenting and he never gets kind of pushed away from the game. Where, uh, you know, in the digital space, he can't trade. If he wants to, you know, try a new deck, he needs to put in like another 20 bucks. He can't do anything else. So uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunities to give players just like great experiences controlling their, their assets. Um, and then when it comes to art, you know, like there, there are people who customize art. And uh, when we look at things like Second Life, people, you know, create digital assets and they had a marketplace to sell them. But in most digital games, there's no ability for players to modify their pieces. And there's no way for an artist to really monetize or control uh, the assets that they're contributing to the system. So I think that's very exciting. And then in terms of you know, gameplay philosophy, we also look at things like Magic. Uh, Magic was designed a certain way. Two players duel each other. That's the only way to play. And players kept on inventing new ways to play. And because it's a paper game, Wizards of the Coast who makes the game can't control how players play the game. Uh, but like digital games, there's usually uh, you know, heavy control around the, the code. And no one can make a different way to play with the cards. And a thing that we're excited about doing is you know, having open source code, letting players invent new ways to play the game. Magic the Gathering, 80% of players, the way they play is not the way that Wizards intended. It was a way developed by the community you know, 10 to 15 years later uh, called Commander. And um, you know, cards that were worth nothing you know, are worth a lot now because you know, uh, fun drives value in Magic. And we think that you know, the same is going to be true in the blockchain space. You know, fun drives value. You know, if you have a, a great thing to do with a card, people are going to want it. And so um, we're excited about letting the community uh, invent and change the game. And because the fundamental value to our company comes from creating NFTs for the game and selling them, we don't have to be controlling or obsessive about the software. Like the software can be free because the collectible is what's important. And I think that lots of companies can be kind of freed in this way by blockchain technology. Cool. That was, I didn't know about the, the, the magic thing. That's very cool um, with the card kind of becoming more valuable later on. So anyway, hi. I'm Andy, um, Andy Dottie. Uh, but my, so I, I work at Stardust, and we are essentially kind of like a, just a quick intro. You know, we're a REST API that for Web3 games, it's how you scale into free to play, or it's a way to scale into free to play all the Web2 users. And for Web2 games, it's a very easy Web2 path to moving people into Web3. Um, so the, to answer the question of you know, why do gamers need, or why do games need kind of Web3, <clears throat> I don't really think that games necessarily need Web3. I think it's kind of like a bonus to games. I think that this is kind of a, a level of ownership and involvement that is a degree beyond what we're used to. And what we're used to is really good. Like everyone here could raise their hand and say they've had fun playing a video game before. We don't need something necessarily better, but it's, it's better though. So I view it kind of like, you know, maybe a bad example off the top of my head is like USA Hockey is like a, an organization that like tracks players and allows them to enter tournaments and things like It's a kind of like a persistency bonus that allows you to prove that you played a game, take items maybe to other games, not necessarily the art and get into that, but um, it's kind of just a, it adds longevity and durability and visibility to an already awesome experience. And then as far as the studios, actually I think there's a lot to be discovered on what, what Web3 will do on the studio side because free to play drastically changed the gaming industry. Um, and I think that Web3 will have a similar effect and um, I'm excited to see, but I definitely don't know. We'll see. Awesome. Hey guys, I'm Kevin Lambert. I am the chief product officer and co-founder of Coin Games, Coin with a K. Um, I have been designing games for 27 years uh, that reach over a billion players. I'm formerly uh, head of design at Microsoft's Casual Game Studio, where I designed the new Microsoft Solitaire and Minesweeper and all the classic casual games that used to come with Windows. And I left my 12-year career at Microsoft because I'm so unbelievably confident that blockchain games that are actually fun and feature true ownership are the future. 
And so I co-founded Coin Games with an amazing team of entrepreneurs and game developers that, like me, have decades of experience making award-winning games, and we are just going to build blockchain games that people want to play for years and will remember forever. But to answer your question, um, you know, another way of, of asking, you know, what value do these bring is what problems does, does it solve? You know, what, and, and my answer to that has always been, we are solving the problem of sunk time and cost in playing video games, right? Like, we've all played video games for years, and we've put hours and hours and hours of time, and we've made purchases and bought items or paid for the game and just sunk all this money into it. And then when you put that game on the shelf, it's all gone. Nothing lives on. There's nothing to show for it, right? So, you know, ownership and putting things on the blockchain give an outlet for some of that time to have value. And I don't mean cash value, I just mean value and composable value and do things for you in other games. And then I think beyond the player experience and what it brings to the player, there's an interesting proposition to the developer. You know, the developers make all these great games and it, you can't talk about them, right? There's secrets and NDAs and things like that. And so you don't really get to engage with the community until after the game ships, maybe a couple of months before when the marketing tends to spin up. But in blockchain games, you have the opportunity to, rather than build them for the customer, you build them with the community. And so you're engaging with the community the whole time. And as a developer, that proposition is awesome because you get to talk about the game. You get to you know, get feedback on the game before you hope it does well when it launches. So it provides something for both player and developer. Absolutely. Uh, I love all the answers from the panelists. Um, so kind of switching gears, right? Um, we've seen several successive cycles in the Web3 gaming space. I mean, I think you mentioned, you know, CryptoKitties, you know, could be kind of seen as a rudimentary game and then, you know, kind of peak hype, we saw Axie Infinity and play to earn. And we've heard a number of other terms, you know, kind of come out, play and earn, play and own. So my question to the panel is, where do you see the market right now? And specifically, what do you see working? Um, so why don't we start at the end here with Kevin and we'll just roll down. Yeah, I think we've seen some great experiments in the Web3 gaming space. You know, with games like Axie Infinity that just went crazy and got all this media attention and they had a unique economy um, and they really advertised a motivation to earn, you know, make money on the side. And I think, I think what we've seen is that that's very difficult to sustain. You know, if you have a motivation to play a game to make money and everyone has that motivation, you're like, well, Where's the money coming from, right? It's, it, it, it's coming from new players, and eventually when the new players slow down, which always happens with games, it gets really hard to sustain that. It falls over pretty quick. So I lean into ownership being the most exciting part of you know, what blockchain brings and where things are headed, and that's something that is sustainable, right? If you play and you're, the game is free and you're earning, you're, you're earning things in the game and you own those things, that's totally sustainable. And you know, the people who have the most exciting, rare, powerful, cool, coveted things might be able to earn something from those, but you don't have to say earn. That doesn't have to be in your motivation. You can play the game for fun and uh, have a sustainable economy with you, with ownership. Yeah, 100%. Um, so I've been on the Stardust team for a little over a year, and I have basically just, you know, five days a week, like 40 meetings talking to game devs since that point. So probably. 1,200 game devs, and I've seen and heard pretty much everything there is. Um, the number of people last year using the term Axie um, was a lot. Uh, it's fallen away. Um, so I, I really I espouse a lot of the things that Kevin just said um, in general. Uh, Chad, what was the question again? So I, so I continue on the right track? No, that's fair. You're totally on the right track, so it's like, what do you see today that's Oh, the winning? market. There's state a lot of, of buzzwords, of right? Yep. Cool. So the state of the market, how is how it's transitioned? Um, absolutely, the game. You'll hear. You'll, I think you'll rarely hear anyone here on stage talk about money or value when it comes to these tokens. Because what game in Web two right now do you start off with paying fifty thousand dollars for? None, because it, that would never. It's not sustainable. It's not going to work. Um, I think there are instances where that will work in Web two, but just in general. Any value or cash is a derivative of how fun the game is and the game loop cycle and maybe grinding in that game and having something that's very rare but organically rare in the game. So just in general, it's gonna be great content. 
Um, uh, I mean, that, that's a good answer. There you go. I, I, think, I think the future is going to be just really solid games and, and uh, as well as, so here's what I'll say. There's going to be also kind of these DeFi games. I came from, I, I you know, was dabbling in Solidity contracts before I moved to Stardust. And I think that these games that are kind of built around smart contracts, you're kind of making a game that's geared towards Linux users, which is cool, but it's not going to be popular, right? There's very, very cool things you can do in Linux, but they're not popular because they're a hassle. And I think that DeFi and these games kind of built around DeFi are, you know, necessary. And they're kind of the core of what Web3 is. It's like permissionless logic and all this other stuff. But when we talk about gaming, so what I'm getting to is the state of the market, I think, is a lot of people in game devs need to kind of align on what is your vision? Is your vision to be kind of like this self-custody, um, permissionless everything? Or is your game mission to be, because I think a lot of game devs in the back of their mind, they really want to scale. And what does that look like in gaming? And Web3 um, kind of operating scaling in Web3 is very difficult. And there's lots of different people talking about different solutions to it. So I think what I'm seeing is more game devs who want to commit to making a game rather than making a version of a, or a gamified version of the smart contract stuff. So I think that is where we're at right now. Um, so for, for my company, we mostly look at what already exists, right? Like there's a lot of hype that, you know, things might be radically different, but ultimately um, when we look at gamers, they're often willing to pay like 25 to $50 to get into a game. Uh, when we look at people who, you know, collect physical gaming products, uh, you know, they might pay tens of thousands of dollars for an original painting. Uh, and so if we're trying to sell like a one of one art NFT, like we think that's a, a reasonable ballpark that someone might pay. Uh, when someone has a limited edition, like rare, you know, version of a card in paper, you know, it often sells for hundreds of dollars. So when we're making a limited run NFT that we think people will collect, like we think that's the right ballpark. And when we're making NFTs for regular users, like we're thinking at like a, a dollar, right? Because this is a price point that is accessible. And when we're thinking about our game, uh, right, we think fun drives value and the, the number of engaged users determines what collectors are willing to pay for you know, the relatively unique objects. So our you know, business model is figure out you know, make a game that's fun, you know, so like 10 or 20 million people want to play it, you know, and then charge a, an amount uh, that is like very accessible for all those players, uh, and then just emulate these old paper economies and, um, you know, watch what else happens everywhere else, but, you know, kind of do what we know. Uh, for me, because I used to work at Riot Games, Amazon Luna, so I had the tendency to bias towards more hardcore games when I joined Dapper Labs about six months ago. But I think now I have come to the realization that because this industry is so new, so nascent, and we're across every platform, right? Asking this question, which genre do you think will thrive as the next wave in blockchain gaming? It's like asking a person, which genre are you think gonna thrive across mobile platform, PC and console? Well, I don't know, <laughs> there's so many possibility. Uh, it's, so we believe, I believe to follow the founder, to follow the studio. When a great founding team, a great uh, kind of content creator creates something, that resonate with the community, that thing become a thing, right? It's like Battle Royale was not really a genre until PUBG came along, Fortnite came along. The casual you know, car game on mobile was not really a thing until Cash, uh, Clash Royale made it, right? So I think it's gonna be the same in the blockchain gaming. We just need more talented, great builder like Alice, Kevin to come into space, either it's CCG, either it's casual game, it could be hardcore. As long as they solve the, all the implementation question, that is a genre. And then people will see that, and then we say, okay, this is great, it's proven, let's follow that, because the majority of the builder, uh, they like to see something that is proven, 
there are very, very few that want to be the only two pioneer because the risk is too high. Absolutely, all very pragmatic answers, and I think that's what we need more of in the Web3 gaming space. Um, so speaking of the actual players here, um, there seems to be a certain uh, animosity of players and also developers around NFTs. So can we kind of talk about that? Why do we think, number one, there's animosity? And number two, what can we do as builders in the Web3 gaming space to kind of address that and hopefully win them over? Um, we'll start with you, Fan. Yes, so I personally had a journey of learning about Web3, a little bit against it, and then question it, and then come to realization that, okay, this actually is great. I think right now, the main reason are two. One, the quality of the blockchain game today, if you just remove the blockchain word, that game itself, if you compare it to the Web2 game, which is an industry that's over two or three decades, the quality is just not there because it's so new, people are still figuring it out, and the first wave of people who got in are not gaming veterans who build multiple console game, and then once they build console game, they move to PC, and once they build PC, they move to mobile, right? So we're only starting to see that wave of qualified gaming veteran entering this space, I would say mid, late last year. And it takes time to build, right? So I believe that will change in the next two years when people see, oh, actually, blockchain games are fun. Well, actually, this game is fun. And then it happened to have some blockchain component. So that's reason number one, the game quality today is still lagging. And it's understandable in a new segment where most people are still trying to experiment and figure it out. The t number two reason, um, admittedly, right, I think last year when the market was really good, there were some behavior that are not really earning the community trust, uh, made the community and the user feel Sure, you want to make money, but you're not really, you know, satisfying my most basic need, which is give me a really fun product. Uh, but again, I think this will start to change in the next two years. And right now, with the market downturn, I actually think it's a great thing for the industry because a lot, a lot of the less focused or less builder type of company will get weed out. Uh, because of the market downturn, it's harder to fundraise. Uh, and the people in the next two years will really stay are the people who understand how to build and then really get user. Uh, yeah, I feel like I've dove in heavily into this topic because um, our project partnered with a bunch of prominent sci-fi and fantasy artists. And um, you know they all got kind of blowback from the community and wanted talking points and wanted people from our company to come out and kind of like speak on their behalf or, you know, back them up. And, uh, you know, I find like the main points, like you said, I feel like there's some unscrupulous parties that like, you know, there are a lot of scams, lots of artists had their artwork stolen. Um, and, you know, like everybody knows an artist and when they imagine their artist friend having their work stolen, they're like, nah, that's, you know, that makes me angry. and. Um, and so I think most people have just seen, you know, the, the exploitation and not the, the benefit. And um, so I, I, think, I think that's where a lot of the animus is coming from. And then in terms of like what we're planning on doing about it, uh, first of all, like we don't need most people to know that they're getting NFTs, right? Like most of our users just want to come and play a game. Uh, they know that they have a collection um, and that they could sell that collection if they wanted to, but uh, you know, most people's experience is they're going to come in with like a social credential, they're going to get a custodial wallet, uh, but it's it's all going to be like behind the UI of the game, and it's just going to be like playing Hearthstone or Magic Arena. You know, your 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 cards are just there, and um, you know, it's the sort of thing where surprise them with a pleasant experience. You know, like they're they're playing a game, they like it, you know. And then, like, they discover they've been using blockchain for you know six months or a year, and they're like, "Well, I guess that was fine. You know, nothing bad happened to my artist friend. Nothing bad happened to the environment. Like, I'm having fun." <clears throat> yeah, 
hundred percent, exactly, exactly that. Basically, I'm gonna just repeat, you know, what <laughs> Fan and Alex just said. But it, like, so the crypto is like the very tip of the bull whip when like it cracks, it, like the market raises, crypto goes stupid, and when it falls, it goes stupid again. So like last year, I was talking to, and not to make a pun on the bull whip, I'm realizing this now, but a guy, a guy came to me and he was like, yeah, so. I sold um, like 500k, thousand dollars worth of tokens. Um, they were cow NFTs, and I want to make a game. I'm like, oh my gosh! Do you know how hard it is to make a game? Like, you have no like he had no idea to make a game. And they, these people, you know, a lot of them went and basically what you're doing is you're borrowing value from your direct user base in your in the name of your brand, and then you have to return that value. And it's a big bet in on your reputation to return that value when you're saying you're gonna make a game. Making a game is very difficult. So I think the animosity um, with gaming specific is that a lot of people talk about it, talked about it, and have yet to return that value. Um, but then what we're gonna do about it, exactly what Alex was saying. I think that it's gonna be good examples of what gaming can look like. And I think for a lot of those examples, you won't know that crypto is involved. Because like I said before, it's kind of just a bonus. It shouldn't be the focus. If the product is crypto, then the product is crypto. If the product's a game, you'll feel the game. So an example um, I want to give is uh, Dr. Disrespect. If you're familiar with him, he's kind of a bombastic internet personality. Uh, he's got his own studio now, and he's doing a game. He recently did a user onboarding event, and he brought in, so at, with Stardust, and we did 400,000 wallets in, in one day, and for all custodial wallets for all these users. 95% had no idea that that wallet was created. That's all it has to be. It doesn't have to be like, there you go, you know, now, thank God I finally have this wallet. No, it's just like they made an account, that wallet is provisioned for them, and anything they do involving tokens will be minted into that wallet. And if they want to do something with those tokens, they can. It's going to be really simple, really easy, and it doesn't need to be much more than that in general. So, totally agree. I'm going to say a lot of the same things, uh, which is good, because we're all aligned on this, Hive but mind. from a slightly different perspective, I guess. So. I've been excited about this space for five years, and I would go to game industry forums and game developer gatherings, and I would evangelize this tech as, dude, it's so cool, it can bring these experiences, it's awesome, and I would just get lynched um, until more recently. But uh, I, I, I've seen why they are, why people, there's, there's developers and there's players, and you know, some of us who have been in the space a little longer have had years to curate the, the crap off of our feed and all the shilling and the fraudsters and the Ponzi scams and we're following smart builders and people who are excited and are gonna be around for a while. But you have to consider from the perspective of someone who reads the headlines, some NFT just sold for a billion dollars and they're like, okay, let me go Google NFTs, what are these things? They land in the lion's den of all the shillers and like, hey, buy my token, you'll get rich tomorrow. Have I told you what to invest in? And they're like, oh, this stuff is garbage. Like, this is terrible. And they haven't had the curation of the feed that we have. So they just land right into that, that group. And then from, I think, from the player's perspective, you know, they're coming from a world where they have played games for decades without any expectation of extraction of value or making money and they're just like, we just want to play good games, and when we look at this space, we don't really see that today. We see all this financialization and, uh, of the games and not the, the core fun. So it's just another way of saying, you know, the games really need to be fun, and because they're a little on the unfun side at the moment, uh, that's one of the reasons why they are kind of down on this space. And as far as what we do about it, I mean, same thing that other people have said, we, we just bury the blockchain. Like, how many games talk about what data service they're using. Yeah, we're on Azure. Yeah, we're on AWS. Let's go. Like nobody, nobody cares. If the game is good, it doesn't matter what engine you use, what data storage platform you use, and that's where we need to get with blockchain. And you get there by just making it whatever. Like you don't talk about it. You just, you have cool stuff in your game. Do you own it? Sure. Yeah, you own it because it's on the blockchain, but it doesn't matter. That's how you solve that. I love the consensus. I know if we had two more hours, I know we can continue talking, but I know we're at the end of our panel here. So certainly, uh, if you have interest in connecting with any of our panelists, make sure to follow them on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or just walk up to them and ask them some questions. But it's been a pleasure speaking with you all and uh, you know, looking forward to the next panel here. So thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you.